Just relax and tell us exactly what happened, Detective Morris said. She held a notepad and pen and had already scribbled a few notes. Since you are the one pressing charges, include every detail, every fact, even if you think it's silly and unimportant. Tell us what you had for breakfast. Something might be relevant that you didn't realize at the time. I would recommend you start at the beginning, Detective Hill said. For the record, state your name, Detective Morris said. We sat in a lounge area near the front of Police HQ. I leaned on my knees and closed my eyes to better remember what had happened. My cheek hurt from the large swollen bruise that had turned purply blue overnight. I'm Kyle Decker. The recent event started a year ago, three years after high school. I can't believe I'm so nervous, I said. Detective Hill chuckled. Everybody says that, so don't worry about it. Just think of this as a safe place, and you can talk about anything. You're among people who want to understand. Somebody knocked on the door and entered, carrying a cup of coffee. I took it, sipped it, and held it to warm my hands. I took a deep breath to keep from being nervous, and when I spoke, it was in a softer voice. I didn't look up. For my story to make sense, I need to back up a few years. Dad never wanted kids and took off when he found out Mom was pregnant. Mom preferred her nose candy to being a parent and often left me alone so she could get high. I was six months old when my grandparents took over custody and I've lived with my grandparents ever since. I only see Mom when she begs for money. I don't know where she is. That must be rough, Detective Morris said. Yeah, it was. When I was younger, I didn't understand why Mom never came by. Anyway, I was in middle school when I came out, but I think most people suspected I was gay. Nobody cared. They said, that's nice, and moved on. That's not a problem here, is it? I said. Kyle, we don't judge. We are here for everybody. We have plenty of coffee, so take your time and finish your story, Detective Hill said. I stared at my hands and remembered. I was a sophomore in high school, minding my own business, when three guys decided I would be an easy target. I don't know why they chose me. For the next three years, they made it their goal to make me miserable. It started with a bunch of little things, and whenever I reported them, the administration did nothing. Jeff Adams. He became student body vice president in his senior year. We'd been friends until we got to middle school. Then he changed when I came out. I wasn't cool enough for him anymore. His friends were Maxwell Whitmore III. He became captain of the debate team in his senior year and winner of many awards. He came from wealthy socialite parents. Mrs. Clarice Whitmore, his mom, wanted to send him to a snobby private school, but his dad, Maxwell Whitmore II, disagreed and a muscle-head weightlifting all-star wrestler named Stuart Lebonsky. Everybody called him Stu. He had a bunch of trophies on display in the academic achievement display case. Stu didn't like me because I made the mistake of asking him out. Not only were those guys friends, they were considered the good kids, the popular kids, the honor students, the leaders of the school, the kids that could do no wrong. Rumor was that Maxwell would be valedictorian at his graduation. They were on the fast track to glory. They made my life miserable. I won't go into details, but the last time I saw them is relevant. January 14th. It was a Wednesday. I'll never forget that day. I was in gym class, showering, because we'd had an intense basketball game. Getting out of the shower... I wrapped the towel around me and walked to my gym locker. Jeff, Maxwell, and Stu were waiting for me. Locker rooms have no cameras, and the coaches didn't want to be seen as perverts, so they seldom monitor it. The perfect place for bullies. I had just pulled my pants on, and like usual, Jeff, Maxwell, and Stu pushed me around, taunted me, and stole my towel. I grabbed the towel. Jeff gripped the other end. What wasn't usual, 
Maxwell dumped some guy's giant drink on me. The floor became wet and slippery. My bare feet had no traction. Jeff let go of the towel. I fell, hard. On the way down, I hit my shoulder on a bench. Jeff, Maxwell, and Stu laughed like they were on a roller coaster. I was the afternoon movie, and they had front row seats for all the fun. Until I started screaming and holding my right shoulder. I curled up into a ball because the pain was so intense. Breaking a collarbone hurts more than breaking an arm, and that hurts like hell. I can't even describe what it felt like. I screamed so loud that the coaches ran in and saw what had been happening. I learned after the ambulance had taken me to the hospital that the three guys ran. They were picked up hours later by the police. Mrs. Whitmore declared that I had framed her son and she would sue and demanded the cops press charges on me. The incident was filmed by several students, including Ross, one of my friends. Nobody could deny the videos, not even Mrs. Whitmore. Thanks to Mrs. Whitmore's lawyer, the school suspended the three guys for barely one day and didn't even press charges. In an interview to Wake Up Vegas, Mrs. Whitmore said, We can't deny those sweet boys made a mistake, but they're honor roll students and promised not to do it again. Yippee, they made the news. Me, I was in the hospital. They kept me overnight to make sure I didn't have a concussion, in addition to the broken collarbone, and I missed school for the next week. Grandpa got angry. I've never seen my grandpa get angry before. Long story short, Grandpa is a lawyer. You don't mess with his family. He wrote a letter stating his intent to sue and press charges, sent copies to the parents of the guys, the school, and the district. Then he sent one to the newspaper and Wake Up Vegas. With each letter, he included a thumb drive with the videos Ross and the other students took. Wake Up Vegas played those on air. The district didn't just look bad. They looked incompetent. Maxwell, Jeff, and Stu looked like sociopaths. As part of my grandpa's legal requests, the school had to send every second of security footage they had to grandpa's firm. Grandpa's interns reviewed the hundreds of hours of video and found seven other instances of those same guys picking on me. Mrs. Whitmore couldn't spin her precious son out of this one. The police weren't as lenient as the school. Juvenile detention. I never heard what happened to them until years later. Until last night, Detective Hill asked. I stared at my hands and gave a little sarcastic half-smile. Life is funny sometimes. Continue, Detective Morris said. Anyway, the press had a party with all the information. For a day or so, I was famous as my story went viral, at least locally. Basically, Grandpa sued the school district, the school, the coaches, and the parents of those guys for a lot of money, plus legal fees, court costs, my hospital fees, and for the bodyguard that would accompany me everywhere because the schools obviously weren't safe. The judge only had to look at my videos, the witness reports, and my doctor's report to agree. The district settled out of court to keep the matter from getting worse. I didn't get the bodyguard, but I did get a nice settlement. We all were seniors and should have graduated in a few months, but they never came back to school. The school brushed the incident under the carpet as fast as possible, and in a month it was business as normal. The rest of high school was physical therapy and the usual teenage angst. Happy ending, Detective Hill said. Weird ending. A few months after my senior year, my grandparents received an odd call with someone needing to interview me. Grandpa shifted the phone to speaker so we could both hear and talk. Kyle, I'm Captain Louise Smith, chaplain for the Army, and she stated an Army base I could never remember. We have someone who is applying for the officer program, but it has come to our attention that there was an incident in high school that you were also involved with. Please go into as much detail as you want and tell me what happened. I've got the time. I will be recording this so I can refer to it later. Grandpa nodded, and for 30 minutes I outlined the many instances of bullying and being ambushed in the locker room and the broken collarbone. 
That's terrible. Please accept my condolences. I have two questions I'd appreciate honest answers to, Captain Smith said. I'm ready, I said, as Grandma brought in tall, cold glasses of root beer for me and Grandpa. The sound of shuffling papers came through the phone, and then Captain Smith's voice. The first question. Let's assume you were a member of a four-man unit with those men, and you were trapped and under fire. Would you expect any of them to come back and rescue you? Would you ever trust them to have your back? They harassed me for months and broke my collarbone. After I was injured, they ran, not caring that I was screaming in pain, I said. It's your opinion. They would abandon a wounded soldier to save their own skin. Not a very good recommendation, Captain Smith said, and it sounded like she wrote something down. Yes, ma'am, I said. There was an odd noise in the background. Who else was listening? Final question. Hypothetical moral dilemma. Let's say one of those men was involved in an accident of some type and would die if he didn't get help. You were the only person in a position to help him. No one would ever know if you did or didn't. For what he did to you, would you let him die or would you save his life? Remember, nobody would ever know. I looked at my grandpa because I didn't know what to say. I can leave if you'd like some privacy, grandpa said. I gulped the root beer before I answered. My grandparents taught me to do what's right. I'd stick with them until they got help. Another odd noise. Somebody was listening. We said our goodbyes, and that's the last I heard from Captain Smith. Three years after high school, I was about to turn 21. Grandpa had placed the settlement into a trust fund so I couldn't touch it until I'm 25. He wanted me to use the money on something important, like buying a house with cash. I told him I wanted to see the world. He chuckled and said, let the interest build up first. I was working my way through college, still am, my major is psychology. I was also saving for a down payment on a two-bedroom apartment. First month, last month, security deposit and moving fees aren't cheap. I love my grandparents, but it was time to live my life. Good thing my friend Ross would share the apartment with me. I work mornings at Coffee Coffee as cashier and barista and janitor and whatever they need. I take summer semesters off so I can mow lawns in the afternoon. I only do it on weekdays and I limit myself to two or three clients a day. It's a good paying part-time job. Now you know the background. Let's get on with the story. Early May, I got this call. Is this Kyle? Hi, I'm Melissa. Some friends recommended you, the Hansons? You work on the yard on Tuesdays. Me and my fiance bought a small fixer-upper that we hope to have remodeled by our wedding. Can you give me a quote about what it would cost to take care of our yard? We'd need two quotes, actually. One for the front yard only, because we'll be storing the remodeling supplies in the back. And when the remodeling is finally done, we'll have you mow both the front and back. That's simple enough. Just so you understand, I take a break from September through March so I can focus on my classes, I said. Front yard this year, and front and back next year. That's fine, she said. I wrote down the address, and once I'd finished my lawns, I drove over. An older house that needed a new paint job. It had two stories, a red tiled roof, and a carport instead of a garage. To the side of the drive was an old basketball hoop. The front yard was a little overgrown, but it had equal amounts of rock beds with drought-tolerant plants and a low-water lawn. The backyard was a little bigger, but it had a dog run, rock beds around the border, as well as a couple of trees. I measured the yard, did a little math, and came up with the quotes. I called Melissa back and told her. She told me that I'd hear back within a week if she chose me for the job. I got the job. So far, this story is pretty normal. Detective Morris said. It didn't stay that way, I said. A week later, I met Melissa at the house, and we spoke about the yard. Since it was a front yard only job, it would only take me 30 minutes. The only time I have available is Friday afternoon. Will that work? I asked. Should be fine. We'll be working, but a lot of workers will be in and out for the next few months. 
New kitchen, new carpet, removing a wall in the living room, paint the entire place. And you won't believe this, but the toilet has a crack in it, Melissa said. Sounds expensive. When are you getting married? I asked. I don't know. We've set three dates and had to change them because the reception hall was booked or my mother-in-law didn't like the date they had available or dad had a conference he couldn't get out of. Maybe we will elope, Melissa said. A lot less headaches, I said. Every Friday for the rest of May, I drove my old truck to their place and quickly spruced up the front yard. Mowing, edging, weeding, removing trash. It took two sessions before I had the place looking good. Melissa even had some plants I installed. The backyard became a warehouse of building supplies. One thing that struck me as odd. Every Friday, 15 minutes after I started, a green Subaru Legacy drove past. Its windows were tinted so I couldn't see who drove, but it seemed like there were two people inside. I received Melissa's payment at the end of the month, in cash. It included a note and a bonus. The yard looks great. The following Friday, the first one in June, some men had set up some scaffolding around the house and were sanding the spots where the old paint had peeled. They were setting up to paint the eaves and were also installing decorative shutters around the windows. We waved and I got to work. The green Subaru Legacy drove past again. Definitely two people were inside it. The light hit the windshield just right and let me see inside. The man in the passenger seat seemed familiar, though I couldn't remember where I'd seen him. Since I worked at Coffee Coffee, I'd met a lot of people. Who is that? I asked one of the painters. The owner checking on us, he said. Why don't they stop? I asked. They do, when they want something, he said. The following Friday, my life changed. The painters had finished priming and were working on the first coat of paint, kind of a light terracotta color, and taking down a warped rain gutter. Some guys painted window frames and door frames. The green Subaru Legacy was in the drive. The owners were here, but that wouldn't affect my job. I plugged my earbuds in and unloaded the lawnmower. As Sweaty Me finished and loaded my gear in the truck, Melissa came out, holding a tall glass of lemonade. Kyle, do you want something to drink? For a moment, she didn't look at me, but when she did, her lip twitched and the lemonade shook a little. It made me nervous. Ever since that day in high school, I get nervous very easily. Do you suffer from anxiety or been diagnosed with PTSD? Detective Hill asked. Never been checked, but I probably do, I said. Continue, Detective Morris said, scribbling another note. I finished putting my gear away and turned to Melissa. Thanks, but I have another job I have to get to. I lied, because this was the last job of the day. I couldn't put my finger on it, but something seemed off. This will be quick. Assuming your original quote is still good, I want to talk about adding part of the backyard to your weekly visits. And I have some more plants I'd like planted. Come with me and I'll show you what I mean, she said with a nervous smile and handed me the lemonade. I took a small sip, fresh squeezed, a little sour, and ice cold, just like my stomach. Her body language bothered me. I beeped my truck and followed her to the backyard. I rounded the corner and stopped. A man stood by the boards for the hardwood floors, staring at nothing. It was the man who had been in the passenger seat last week. I remembered where I had seen him before. My throat became dry, my jaw set, my fist clenched. Melissa noticed my reaction. Take it easy, Kyle. It had been three years since the guys had bullied me and had broken my collarbone. That day was permanently etched in my brain. In spite of all my grandfather had done, I was still angry and fearful and sad and depressed all at once. There were three faces I would never forget. Stu's was one of them. 
the muscle-head weightlifting wrestler I had had a crush on back in the day before he ruined my life. About my height, amber eyes, casual brown hair worn a little long, he wore a black long sleeve shirt in spite of the heat and black jeans and black sunglasses. His left wrist was covered in black mala bracelets and knotted twine bracelets and leather strap bracelets and crystal bracelets and even a rainbow one. One bracelet had a silver emblem on it. Stu must be wearing twenty bracelets on his forearm. One hand kept twisting the bracelet with the silver medallion. The way the muscles pushed against the shirt, Stu kept in shape, but he moved like he was his own ghost. Something in my chest hurt. Is this what a heart attack felt like? Time to run. Stu spoke to one of the painters. The painter nodded. Stu didn't see me. I had serious feelings for Stu. Once. I still had serious feelings, but they weren't love. Try anger and hate and fear. Was he Melissa's fiancé? Didn't matter. I'm out of here. Deal's off, Melissa. You'll need to find another landscaper. I quit, I said, turning around and heading for my truck. No job was worth being around Stu. Wait a minute, Melissa said. I'll mail you a refund, I said. Kyle, I want to talk to you, Melissa yelled. I kid you not, Stu jumped as soon as she yelled my name. What else he did, I don't know, because I walked as fast as I could for my truck. Kyle, stop, Melissa said. She must not have heard me say, I quit. I didn't stop. I didn't turn around. Quickly, I beeped my truck, opened the door, and was about to climb in when her hand took hold of the door. Would you listen to me? Melissa ordered. Back in high school, your fiancé broke my collarbone and humiliated me. I'm not coming over here again. Move your hand, I shouted. Stu's my brother, and you two will sit down and talk, she yelled. Why? Because I said so. Because I already made dinner for the two of you, and it's inside. Because I want my brother back, she yelled. The inhuman monster and his friends made my life hell. I had a temporary restraining order against them so I could sleep nights. No, I said. I know what happened, and I'm sorry he did that. Stu's dealing with a major depression. I want Stu to smile again. I want to hear him laugh. I want him to go outside and live. Nothing else I've tried has worked, so please, just talk to him, she said. So you set me up. Guess what? Your brother and his friends made it so I didn't want to go to school, and when I did, they found me. Your brother is not the only one who dealt with depression. My grandparents got me a counselor who helped me smile again. So, no, I don't care if your brother ever smiles. In fact, I would prefer he never did, I said. Melissa took a deep breath and let out a long sigh. I will pay you your going rate for one hour of your time. Actually, double your rate. One hour. It's all I ask. We'll sit out front in full view of your truck, and I'll set a timer. I will be there, and my fiancé as well. If Stu tries to hurt you, I'll rearrange his face as only a big sister can get away with. But I guarantee you, Stu won't do anything. He's different now. You'll see. Please, help me. I can't believe I said this. You get one hour, but I will leave if given any excuse and I don't promise to say anything. Melissa gave me a gentle hug and said, That's all I'm asking. In five minutes, Melissa, her fiancé, and Stu sat on the porch holding plates with lasagna and garlic bread. My untouched plate sat on the porch next to my lemonade. I remained standing with arms folded, ready to run. I didn't say anything. Stu didn't say anything. Melissa looked at her fiancé, and he placed an arm around her shoulders. She looked worried. Ten minutes of arctic silence later, I said, Still lifting? Kind of, Stu said, his face a granite mask. I work at Lincoln Gym.
Good for you, I said. More silence. Stu, why don't you tell Kyle about what happened to you and the others? I don't think he knows, Melissa said. Was she trying to make me feel guilty, or just get Stu talking? I waited. It took Stu a minute before he said anything, and then it was more of a mumble. When we got out of juvie, Jeff joined the army. Except for one Christmas card, I haven't heard from him. The Whitmores moved to a place near Carson City, so no one would know what their precious little Maxwell had done. Their high-priced lawyer tried to make the charges disappear, but all he could do was commute the juvie sentence to community service and house arrest. Maxwell Whitmore the third only served a day where we were there ten days. I never did like the snob, and I liked him less after Mommy waved her magic money wad. An odd sound escaped Stu's lips. He hung his head and whispered, I'm sorry. If I could do anything to change that year, I would, even just that day. It was Jeff's idea, and like an idiot, I went along with it. Stu started crying and rotated the bracelet. His thumb kept rubbing the one with the silver medallion. Stu was melting down. What had Melissa done? Melissa put a hand on Stu's shoulders, but he shrugged it off and made no attempt to hide the tears or the way the emotion reddened his face. We made your life hell, and then I realized we did the same to us. My parents are so ashamed they won't speak to me, and last time I visited, Dad was still angry. We raised you better. They ignore me. My sister took me in when I got out of the hospital, Stu said. Hospital? I asked. Rehab, Melissa whispered. I'm gay too, but I didn't tell anyone, especially Jeff or my parents. I was trying to please everybody, be the way I thought they wanted me to be. When you asked me out, I couldn't say yes, because I didn't know what my dad would do, and I was afraid I wouldn't have any friends. Guess what? That's where my life is right now, Stu said, his voice trailing off. When he got out of juvie, he secretly broke into our parents' alcohol stash to cope. He did it for months, maybe years. Mom found him passed out on the floor and called an ambulance alcohol poisoning, which led to three months rehab, which ended a few weeks ago, Melissa said. Stu jumped up and screamed, his lemonade spilling all over the porch. Do you have to tell everybody? Yes, I'm an alcoholic. Are you happy? I've destroyed Kyle's life. I've destroyed mine. My parents don't trust me and refuse to see me. I can't keep a job for more than a few months. I dropped out of college. I don't have any friends. Both you and me know that it's better if I live on the streets where everybody can forgive me. There, I've admitted it. I don't know what you thought me meeting Kyle would achieve, but it's torture. Leave me alone. Stu, you're my brother, and it hurts to see you like this, Melissa said, beginning to cry. Stu rotated the bracelets again. He hadn't taken off his dark glasses. Because of my grandfather, I'd been able to heal, sort of. Stu did not. His self-hatred turned inward and festered into something ugly, an emotional cancer that was eating him alive. The fear and anger and hatred in my soul turned to pity. The part of me that had liked him remembered what this man had been like, and I wanted to cry. I'm studying to be a psychologist because sometimes people need help. The words I had said to Captain Smith repeated in my head. My grandparents taught me to do what's right. I'd stick with him until he got help. I'm sweaty, covered in dirt and lawn clippings, and smelled a little of gasoline and fresh trimmed lawn. I'm crazy for what I'm about to do, and I can't believe I'm doing it. Grandpa once said, everybody deserves a second chance. I took a deep breath my heart beating like an earthquake, and I held out my hand. Stu, let's go for a walk. 